Okay, let me get back here. Um, on Sanibel, we started having a celebrating poetry in the year 2000. It was at an art gallery that's still there. I forgot its old name, and tonight, and today, this afternoon, I forgot its current name. <laughs> but let me tell you that uh, it was a wonderful experience for me and for others. And the one who put it together at that time was a woman who was then writing a column for um, the, um, the Island Sun, the other newspaper besides the Islander. And um, she also happened to be a, a wonderful poet. And we'll hear one of her poems uh, very shortly. Uh, and she put it together and we kept it going for quite a few years. And, uh, except for the two years of the um, COVID and the pandemic, uh, we've had one every year. And the last 10 or 12 years uh, here in the library. So it's become a custom and a tradition. And along the way in a custom, when you have customs and traditions, you accumulate certain habits and certain things that you have to do. Uh, I just uh, want to make an announcement or two before I get to those uh, and say that after this is over, the poets to give me a copy of the poem they wish to appear in the library's program, Poem of the Day, that they have during that we have here in the library during Poetry Month, and uh, um, they should uh, give it to me, okay, when this is over, I'll be uh, there to collect it. Uh, we will have a session for those who weren't the featured poets uh, as soon as we finish going through our list and hearing from we have about 22 or 23 poets who are what we call featured poets. They were asked to attend and they, they have prepared very carefully. And they will each be given four minutes and they will introduce themselves. So if they want to introduce themselves and talk about themselves instead of the poetry. It'll have to come up. The poets time a lot of the poetry. I say that because I've had experience with someone who introduced themselves for three minutes and then complained when they only had like one or two minutes left for the poem. So, um, and also when poets have a tendency sometimes to explain their poetry first. And I urge them not to do that because it takes away from the time for the poet and it says something about your poetry if you have to waste too much time explaining it. <laughs> and, I'm and I may still do more when I explain it. I'm not the one to talk about explaining my poetry. Um, that's about it. Without any further ado, I would like to do one or two start uh, festivities of Poetry Fest today. I believe it's the 20th Poetry Fest with some of our traditions. One of our traditions is the prologue. And I apologize to Willie Shakespeare for borrowing or some of the prologue from Henry V to begin our poetry fest. Oh, for a muse and liar that would transcend the Sanibel Fort Myers connection. A library for a stage, poets to act, and audiences to behold the swelling scene. Then should the Sanibel and Southwest poets Unleash their pleas for our posterity to help preserve 
our island Sanibel, with liberal eye warming like the sun, infesting our fest with poetry. Admit me then to this revelry and prologue like your rapt attention quest, gently to hear, wisely to judge our fest. I'm sure that uh, Shakespeare wouldn't mind my imitating that. Um, and another tradition is, and this happened the second or third year of our poetry fest, we have a rap sonnet in which we announce the goals of our poetry fest. We'll take our poetry. We'll take our poetry from wherever it comes, from seniors and rest homes, from brackets and slums, from housewives and kitchens, slammers and cafes, from yuppies and condos, from shamans and Jose's, from professors in colleges and teens asking why our poets we will bring with their laughter and cry. We'll take our poetry, whatever it's time, from free verse to meter, from hip hop to rhyme, from sonnet to ballad, from ode to pantoum, our poetry will explode in one sonic boom. <coughs> we'll take our poetry to wherever it goes, past horizons of heart to the depths of our souls, and keep searching for truth wherever it may be. We'll tell it like it is with our poetry. Thank you. And I have one more as a tradition, I'm sorry. This is a poem I usually print in the, my column to sort of announce the celebration of uh, Poetry Month and the first of April. An April Fool for Poetry. An April Fool was I for poetry, for jests and tricks and play with irony, fooling the muse with rhyme tongue foolery, every verse with loose, every fancy free. <clears throat> Until the world, too wide and wide for me, turned my fool's errand into odyssey, to roam as far as my mind's eye could see, horizons glowing with discovery. No fool of mine now for poetry, for mindless myth and made up history. The cruelest month, now kind as kind can be, and poetry is no longer a fool for me. Thank you. I spoke about Marianne Strickland, um, who began, who was the mother of the uh, poetry fest who created them, and who some of, some of our some of our poets do remember her fondly. Um, she wrote a poem called "A Poet." about a nervous poet getting up to recite before an audience of poets for the first time. And here to recite that poem is a wonderful poet herself and a wonderful reciter of poetry, Tanya Hoxton. Good afternoon. So this is the 
the poem that uh, Marion Strickland wrote for Joe, and it's entitled The Poet. Stands at the lectern, looks down at his page, then at us. His eyes say, wait till you hear this. Arms rising with his voice, he begins to sway on the balls of his feet. He eases into rap. Words fly through the air, crackle around us. His eyes dance. Fifty years of holding back the mountain of words, now they avalanche, rumbling, crashing, polished agates, blue, red, green, a phrase, a scene, a thought, anything sets them rolling. Only months ago, he had shown up at a poetry reading, asking if he could read. When he stood, the page rattled in his hands. His voice wavered. Applause cracked the crust. He celebrated with a margarita the size of a birdbath. <laughs> he donned white pajamas and wrote in the night poems about people, alligators, golf, poems about poems, everything a gift. He wrote as if he had wasted his life and had six months to live. But with every line, years dropped off. He was 20 again, alive. When the mountain cracks, we will hear his soul. And um, I have two poems to read, each of them about two minutes. And the first one is really so light because one was trying to get away from COVID and all the sadnesses of what's happening politically in the world. Can a hippo swim? Mum used to sing to us about the hippopotamus. He can stay, so they say, underneath the water for half a day. We loved the rhyme of the song, especially when we were young. But to believe a hippo can swim is wrong. They have the urge to submerge, and they wallow. But beneath the water, they find it difficult to swallow. Hippos neither crawl, nor do the butterfly. Have you ever seen a hippo splashing by? Ever? Never. Backstroke is out of the question. A hippo just can't pull his chest in. They are champs at walking underwater. The record is a mile and a quarter. Well, maybe a little shorter. In the river, they are fiercely territorial. Sadly, this has been proven by many a memorial of villages in Africa, south of the Sudan, where people know Mvubu often kill man. But in our youthful days, the facts of life were hidden. Bad news, bad people, bad language was forbidden. And as far as hippopotami were concerned, happy tunes were all we learned. Mum told us hippos were clever fellows in their way, although she added, they can't say hip hooray. <laughs> and this next one is entitled The Hawaiian Fisherman. At first light, we see him outlined against the reef, balanced on the lava edge, an aboriginal statue linked by tribal memory to rock, water, fish. One hand shields his eyes, blocks the ocean haze, draped over a muscled shoulder, a throw net. Its skirt weighed down by lead swirls around his ankles. A flicker of fin absorbs his world. Even as the strong tide washes white over the rocks, yoga still, he watches. We, already caught, sit and wait. In the silence, he teaches us patience. We wait. Then, in an explosion of movement, he casts the throw net in a perfect circle, a lasso. It surrounds the fish. They dissolve beneath the water. All action, he cinches the net. The fish, eyes and astonished mouths, buck and tangle. He pulls the netted catch onto his belly, carries the weighted glisten and gleam to the water's edge. The radiance of the rising sun highlights his pot of gold. Thank you. Thank you. My name 
is Dorothy Brooks, and I live in Punta Gorda, and I appreciate coming down to Sound Bell to read to you. Um, my first poem starts with an epigraph. The epigraph is from Richard Wilbur, and it says, All that we do is touched by ocean, yet we remain on the shore of what we know. So the poem is titled, Touched by Ocean. I dream of silver maples, three trees standing side by side, large and perfectly shaped, silhouetted against a pale sky. And I am part of a group of artists studying them from a distance, what to make of them, how to capture their shimmering beauty, enter their lovely stillness, the moment fleeting, the mystery recedes, nature its cycles of ripening and decay. I wake, and in the half-light, think of Lauren in her hospital room. Her body shutting down, her fear. The evening she drove out to view the stars, gazing on the vast, inevitable.